good afternoon everybody I'm very glad to be here and very kind of you to be here and listen to us launch a book it's been extremely exciting last one year when we started this book as Prabhu mentioned in Alexandria so I'll delve directly into it and so it's so the main message that uh, we have here in the initial introductory chapter to this book is that we have to understand food system as a dynamic one. That's how we define food system. And this dynamic food system works around the role of economy and overall growth and development and how they are structured in different regions of India. The standard narrative around India's structural transformation and growth story is that structural transformation in India, as we understand, is decline in share of agricultural output and share of agriculture in the GDP and labor share coming lower over time. But the narrative around India is that we have had a stunted structural transformation where people are still stuck in agriculture, though share of agriculture in overall output has been declining. So the nuance that we bring to this debate is that actually India is not, structural transformation story of India is not one unified story. There are so many different variation by region. And that's what we show in this picture. So if you look at different states of India, India comprises of 30 states, and all of them are different stages of structural transformation. So on the y-axis, we have agriculture share uh, in total output, and on the x-axis is uh, per capita state GDP. From, uh, so what you see here, different states, which represent different colors, have different slopes over time, so how they've changed. And why this has happened, this differential pattern of growth and transformation, different states, is because initial endowments and investment in agriculture back in 60s and 70s, when we had the technology uh, shock to the economy, which led to what growth patterns that we have. And this was all kick-started by agriculture, which has traditionally been the main driver of economic growth across countries, across the world. So what we argue is that regions like Punjab and Haryana in the Indo-Gangetic Plain, Upper Indo-Gangetic Plain, invested heavily in agriculture uh, in, the, in, in the 1960s and 70s, which led to their better growth, their urbanization later, and gradually the move, move towards more service sector-driven economy, which is how the structural transformation takes place. The same didn't happen in many other parts of India, like the poorer regions of India, uh, these part, the eastern part, and these are where much of the problem lies in terms of poverty, in terms of malnutrition, and even governance problems. So that's the nuance that we bring to the structural transformation debate here. Uh, this is essentially linked to the problems of overnutrition and undernutrition that we talk about later. But what this classification, uh, what this characterization does is to label these different states and different paces of structural transformation as three distinct categories. We define the lagging states, which I just showed UP, Bihar, and other eastern states, where urbanization is low, share of agriculture in overall GDP is low, and there's a lot of people who are still engaged in agriculture. And then we have a different category of state, which is agriculture-led states, which leveraged agriculture out, of, uh, out, out into other sectors. But still, agriculture is the main dominant share of livelihood. These are the agriculture-led states, and these include Punjab, Haryana, Andhra Pradesh, basically those who benefited from Green Revolution much more than other states. And then we have the urbanizing states, which took the industrial route to development. So Kerala, Goa, Maharashtra, Gujarat are examples of it. So these basically form the backbone of this book in terms of how we postulate many of uh, policy implications of what this means, why this book is important, and how should we understand the whole food system, as I said, which is a very dynamic one. And things over in the future, which is aptly the title of the book, also will evolve around how these states move around in different classifications. So we might say in the future, states in lagging moving to agriculture-led and urbanizing. That's the standard uh, structural transformation story. So this is the lay of the land. And now there are two important things for future. What are the opportunities and what are the challenges? So what we argue in the book is that the opportunities come from two things. First is urbanization. Second is changing diets. Why changing diets? I'll first talk about because much of the initial story of India's agriculture revolution and agriculture driven growth was heavy investment in staple grains, which was where Punjab Haryana had comparative advantage and they benefited out of it. But now diets are changing. People are no longer consuming staple grains in the same quantity. I mean, we just had quinoa for lunch, so 
That's, and this is becoming a common thing in India. If you go to corporate offices, people are actually eating quinoa salads for lunch. So this is increasing. Of course, that's a very sliver of the population, but then changes start from there. So what we argue here is that if you look at the 40, 50 year period, the share of staple grains in terms of expenditure, in terms of calorie and everything has been declining. And the importance of other food groups has been rising. So we should focus on these food groups as a way and take an opportunity to transform our food system. So therein lies one important aspect. And the second most important aspect is India is rapidly urbanizing. We all hear stories about India becoming centers of service sector revolution, skilled labor, and all this is happening. So urbanization. But why is urbanization important for rural areas? It's very important. Why? Because as India urbanizes, we're increasingly seeing the blurring of distinction between rural and urban. The binaries of rural and urban are increasingly being less salient. Why? Because rural areas are transforming. Cities are reaching them. Why? Because transportation infrastructure has increased. The importance of technology in terms of how people consume, consumer behavior is changing. But there's a distinct pattern of urbanization, which is important to highlight, which we do in the book, is that India's urbanization process is not the usual urbanization process, which we have seen where people migrate from rural areas to urban areas and settle there. We have had more commuting than migration. Why? Because rural areas are changing. Transport infrastructure has been heavily invested in the last few years. So they don't have to actually move. They can commute. So that's how even rural areas are uh, changing, and the opportunities lie in establishing rural agglomeration economies around major towns, which are coming up in big numbers, because uh, it, it's, it's not easy to go to the manufacturing route, which you've seen in other parts of the world as well. So using urbanization, growth of small towns, growth of census towns, are a useful way to, character, uh, to see the transformation in rural areas. And this important challenge is very critical for the lagging regions, especially where we see much more rural areas, but a, a spurt of towns around them. And there's been massive changes over the past decade or so. So these are the two opportunities as well as challenges. But the thing is, diets are changing. Demand for diets is changing. But has supply kept pace with it? So therein lies the challenge. Supplies for these different food groups, which are not staples, has been a challenge. And so therein lies uh, uh, the potential for investment in the future. So this is the argument here. Then most important, if the price of different food products which people want to consume is increasing, the government has to help especially poor in some ways. And that's what we have been doing traditionally in terms of providing staple grains, rice and wheat at a very subsidized prices to the poor on a targeted basis. So India has, public, has had public distribution programs since 1940s as a very important way to ensure food security for the poor people. But then if people are not consuming staple grains that much, should we subsidize them, or should we think of other options which will lead to more nutritious diets? So that's been the major challenge. We provide a slew of recommendations and the debate around the whole safety nets in India, which not only includes food, but also not include non-food. We should go and delve deeper, and you can have a look in the, uh, in the, in the book. Why this, prob why this is problematic is because this whole thing of space, uh, staple grain procurement as a result of distribution has come up, which has led to these interlocked channels of you proc uh, the government procuring from the farmers, storing in, then distributing it through a lot of storage and all these ways, has led to a lot of political economy problems with vested interests, which has actually undermined India's overall nutrition in some ways, which we highlight. And that's why we say we should start looking beyond these food-based safety nets, especially in terms of how different states have grown, their requirements, their nutritional needs, most important, what kind of nutritional food they want. And because why is it important? Because India is one of the countries which not only has the highest rate of undernourishment, but also we, see, we are seeing an increasing case of overnutrition, which is obesity. Uh, and I'll stop here and I'll let Anaka take over from there. She'll introduce you to the concept and how things are happening there. Thank you.